Hi, my name is Matt Gordon and welcome to my session on speech and language AI for the data professional. Let's switch over to the slides and let's get going because you certainly did not come to see an hour of my face talking about this. Let's see some slides and demos and all those sorts of things. All right, let's get the slides advancing and we're off to the races. Okay. Um, so what I want to call your attention to on this slide is really these last two lines. Um, so I lead the local user group in my town. And I would encourage you, if you're involved in a, in a user group or local event or large event like this or something along those lines, please stay involved. I know it's challenging right now with really fluid situations everywhere, but being involved in user groups and SQL Saturdays and conferences like this um, really has changed my life. I was fortunate enough to be in person at DPS two years ago to to talk about some of the same topics that I'm going to talk about here. They've obviously changed a lot, um, but that was one of the coolest experiences of my life. And it means a lot to be at this version of it as well. Um, but please get involved in, and stay involved somewhere. Um, you really will get a lot out of it. And what I've always said is the worst case is you're going to maybe learn something you don't know when you attend an event like this, especially if it's free. There's really no downside, right? Um, so the worst case is you're going to learn something you didn't know. The best case is you may make a friend. You may get a job or a line on a job that changes your life. Uh, all of those have happened to me. So thanks for being here. Thanks for attending my session. Thanks for attending all the sessions this week. Uh, and I do want to note here, I, I am SQL at speed everywhere online, Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, all of that. So hopefully with this slide and the next two after this, um, you uh, feel like that you know a little bit about me and you're able, if you'd like to, to kind of reach out and turn this conference into the networking opportunity that a lot of in-person events are. So this is where I'm from. Um, if I recall correctly, when I was in Bangalore two years ago, I was roughly 9,000 miles from home. Uh, but if you're not familiar with with the US, uh, I'm, I'm the red state there. So that is the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And that's where I live and run the Lexington user group there. And like I said, I'm SQL at speed everywhere online because occasionally I get to drive race cars like these. Um, I only show this to you for two reasons. One, if you really don't like my talk, but you think racing is cool, I'm always ha it's the only thing I like to talk about more than data and AI stuff. Um, but I also, you know, like I said, hopefully this is one of the sessions you walk away from this week and say, wow, that was something new and different. And, and that was the racing guy. And You'll remember that I'm SQL at speed and you can find me that way pretty much anywhere. And hopefully, you know, we can chat further about some of the things that, that we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about here now. But you're not here to learn about me or, or any of that and hear me talk about why conferences are awesome. Uh, we're here to learn about speech and language AI. So I'll say this. Um, the branding around this, the marketing around this has always been challenging. Um, Microsoft builds so many cool things, but <laughs> the terminology and things like that, uh, it, let's say it's, it's evolving and, and sometimes challenging. So you may know this as Microsoft AI. You may know this as the language API. You may know it as Azure Cognitive Services. Um, you may have heard it called any and all of these things. So. What I've found is, is when when you talk about it as AI, it resonates more with people. Azure Cognitive Services, people aren't sure what that is. And like I said, I've, I've actually spoken about these topics for about four years. And the audience is always more interested when I talk about what well, we're talking about, AI things, but it's marketed under the Azure Cognitive Services umbrella because uh, not everybody walks in the door knowing what Azure Cognitive Services is. So hopefully this talk kind of makes that make sense and you'll understand why some of those terms are interchangeable. And a lot of this stuff is really the same thing. It's just been called different things over the years and, and they do still evolve that even now. So what is this stuff? Um, so when you see things in quotes here in my slides, it's things I've borrowed from the marketing 
documentation that Microsoft puts out. So I like the way they phrase it. Not taking credit for, for the phrasing here, but I think it sets up nicely what a lot of these things do. So Azure Cognitive Services, broadly, is a set of APIs. And what does that mean? So marketing says what's in quotes there, sets of ML algorithms solve problems in the field of AI. It's incredibly broad and vague, right? There's a reason for that. Um, I started working on this stuff in, I'd say, October of 2017. Started with, with the language API and a silly thing for a podcast here in the, in the States to rank English Premier League football clubs by the sentiment of their supporters on Twitter. A completely nutty thing to have spent a bunch of time on. But so it did that. And we'll talk about sentiment analysis later and, and when we get into the language API stuff, but I need to set this foundation first. So then the language API, it had more features than that, but it didn't have tons and tons and tons. Um, that has changed. And so this wording really hasn't changed because they're putting so much more stuff under this umbrella that, than they used to. And uh, speaking as somebody who spent just about two years working on a, on a book with some folks, um, it was challenging to keep our content evolving as things changed even then. Um, even as we got close to press, it came out about a month ago. Um, so August of 2021, if you're watching this at a later date. Um, so yeah, this this evolves. It's worded vaguely because it is vague because they're always building new stuff underneath it. Um, what's the layman's version of everything I just said? So it's code, there's ML models, algorithm basically it's code you can call with code of your own or bots of your own as well and so how can you use those so if if you tend more to be on on the app dev side and and like that more kind of traditional dev and like to write code these can all be consumed via standard rest calls i'm not going to spend a lot of time going over that but i will go over some we'll kind of build up from uh lower complexity things to what i would say is maybe the most complex way to call these um, but there's also ways to interact with no code at all logic apps so we'll look briefly at those speech studio q a maker th things like that <clears throat> pardon me um you don't have to call any code you can drag and drop stuff and, and you're still going to get access to to all of this um but you don't have to write a line of code to do it. But you can write a bunch of lines of code if you want to. So how do you learn to call them? So obviously here in an hour, um, and then we'll have 15 minutes of live Q&A after this, which I'm really excited about. It's always good to talk to folks. Um, I don't have time to give you, you know, the, here's how you call all of them. And, and we're, if I spend an hour breaking down like API calls and methods and things like that, I have a feeling uh, it would be pretty boring for, for most. Uh, and I'm probably not even the most qualified person to do that. Uh, and that's why I put the link to the documentation here. So I just made fun of Microsoft a bit for their phrasing and, and terminology and some of those things but when they do something right i want to call out that they've done it right the documentation for all the cognitive services stuff and in my opinion is absolutely outstanding um, the link is there so when you're able to access these slides you can click that you can also just uh, google azure cognitive services documentation link will be right towards the top of that page uh, it's wonderful. Not only does it go into kind of each call and it talks about, you know, each, everything you're going to pass in, um, but most of the document, and you'll see even some links through here and some things that I'm going to show you, most of the stuff builds on uh, or links out to quick start examples where you can either kind of walk through it and, it, and there's a long version of the doc that will hold your hand through building all this stuff, or you can download sample code and get it running in just a few minutes locally. And we're going to look at a couple things later that, that where I've basically done that, just to kind of show you how some of this stuff works. So long story short, um, the documentation's fantastic. And uh, yeah, so I want to call that out. So let's dive a little deeper into what these are. So the list, and, and you're going to hear me use the term like API and service interchangeably here, only because um, largely the at least the marketing documentation and, and even some of the more technical docs as well uh, use the term interchangeably. And so I kind of slip 
back and forth. Uh, but so there are four major ones. And if you go to the main page for cognitive services, you're going to see this. So there's vision kind of does what it sounds like, analyzes images, videos, things like that. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but the documentation is, and the examples and quick starts on that stuff that go with it is also very good. So if you walk away from this and you're like, well, the speech and language stuff was cool, but I'd really like to look at vision. Um, great documentation out there, great examples in our book. Uh, but I, I don't mean to shill for that. Uh, but there's ton, tons of good content out there. So we're not going to spend any more time on that. Speech and language, we're going to spend a lot of time on that in the rest of this hour. So I'm going to spend very little time on it here. Uh, but it, you know, it does kind of what you would think that it does. So, um, you know, it, 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 language is kind of written text stuff. Speech is audible text stuff, but they work very interchangeably, which is why I've built this session because they kind of build off each other and you can get them to talk to each other. And I feel like of all of these, probably for a data professional, uh, this, this is likely to be kind of the most, um, the most accessible thing for us because it kind of meets us where, where a lot of us are, right? Uh, and there's also the decision API as well, and which is, I would argue, almost some more advanced language stuff, but it goes deeper than that. So if vision or decision kind of piques your interest here, I invite you to go to the docs and seek out sessions on those. We're going to talk about speech and language for the rest of this time because I think like it's the foundation of almost all the communication we have. You, know, you could argue video and like facial expressions are, are a key part of interpersonal communication, but broadly, we're probably either writing something to somebody or we're saying something to somebody. So for me, these are these are those foundational elements. And like I said, these APIs, and really all of them can, but these two play very nicely with each other. And really the last thing I'll show you at, at the end of the session, I, I, I hope brings that home. Uh, that demo has a bit of a challenge in it because we're virtual, but we'll talk about that when, when we get there. It's still cool. Um, most of this stuff, now this is, I would say, almost completely true for language, slightly less true for speech, but still mostly true. It's JSON under the covers. So really you're deserializing arrays and, and things like that. Um, I'll show you an example of kind of how that works, which I think will bring that home. Uh, but it is more human readable than you might guess, especially if you're not an experienced app dev, which I certainly am not. Um, and I, and I want to reinforce that. I know just enough to be dangerous, but I don't want you walking away being like, well, I've got to learn C sharp to, to work with this stuff. You absolutely don't If you did, I, I probably wouldn't play much with it. So what's the language API? We're going to start there. Um, that's where the majority of my experience is. And I, like I said, it, I think it's probably the easiest to access and kind of understand. And, and there's some cool demos we can do to go, go through this stuff as well. So what does Microsoft say it is? And again, we've got some quotes. So marketing people had thoughts that I would like to share. Um, it increases your application's ability to read, comprehend, and enrich written text. Broad and vague, right? It is. Uh, but like I said, this has matured so much since I started playing with it uh, about four years ago right now. And that statement really hasn't. So it's one of those things if, if you can think like, well, I'd love to do this to, to an HTML document or, or I'd love to do this to text in my app or something like that. There's likely a way to put that together here. Um, so just... I, and I'll say this over and over again. I encourage you to kind of use this session as a jumping off point to discover all that this stuff can do because um, I think it's really cool. And my favorite part of giving sessions on this over the years is when somebody comes back and says, hey, I saw your session and it gave me an idea to build this and I built it and it was awesome. And maybe they got a new job or they got a bonus or they just had fun with it. Um, it's all really, really cool stuff. So what's the layman's version or the less marketing -y version of what it is? Really what it does is it helps us in any apps we make uh, talk to users customers or maybe folks that, that might play those roles as well. And again, the wording here is weird because you're going to see when you go to, if you uh, click into the documentation for speech, you're going to see it called speech service. You won't see API said there very much, even though it used to be. In the language documentation, you're going to see API referred to much more. 
just kind of understand those for, for our purposes as people new to this. It's very interchangeable terms. And language API is not just one thing. There's a lot of APIs underneath it. And like I said, they, they almost all of them can work with each other to, to build some pretty rich and very cool things. So what are the highlights? <clears throat> so these are really kind of not five pillars, but um, these are, and I don't want to overuse the term umbrella, but these are like five categories, I would say, um, of where the language API and, and the services that it offers falls under. Um, so we'll walk through these one by one over the next five slides. And then I'm going to dive deeper into a few of these. Because again, what I want this to be is not, we're just going to nerd out on AI for an hour, even though that would be really cool and fun. I want people to walk away with a sense of, oh, I could take this back to my job and maybe build something with what I learned. Because a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you is easy. A lot of these demos were built in a matter of minutes. And maybe I've tweaked them over the years. Uh, maybe I haven't. But this, this, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show today is not complicated. You can go very complicated if you want to. That's not my intent here. Uh, but I just kind of want to expose you to, to everything we can do um, and hope that you find some of this helpful or at least cool. So we'll start with immersive reader. So I referred to earlier as, or I talked about AI for good, which you may have seen. Um, you'll see it as like a LinkedIn hashtag, a Twitter hashtag. It's, you know, it goes beyond Microsoft, but it's kind of the sense of, so we can do a lot of really interesting things with the power of AI. Uh, we can do some potentially unethical and bad things with it. And if we had longer, I always think that's an interesting topic to dive into. Uh, but we can also do good things, things that really help people. And that's why I always like to start here, because we're going to talk about stuff after this. And you're like, oh, that's cool, or oh, that's fun, or I can use that at work. Um, but especially depending on the field you're in, I, th I think immersive reader is really cool. So again, we've got some marketing speak here. It's intended to help the groups of people that are talked about there um, to absorb the written content on your site. So right, this may not be 100% altruistic because maybe you want more people on your site, more people in your app to buy more stuff, right? And that's okay. But where I think there's been really inspiring use of this is uh, healthcare environments, educational environments, things like that. Uh, you know, maybe it's children learning to speak their native language. Maybe it's somebody who's learning to speak a new language, their second or third. Uh, maybe they've moved somewhere and don't know the language at all and they need help with it this there's a lot of power here to kind of help you do all of that um, so I, I, this is always a fun place for me to start here so just some examples of what you can do you can change the viewable size of the text so you know obviously that's kind of an accessibility thing uh, people with vision challenges um, that's going to be a big help to them uh, and then you get into some stuff maybe that's helping more people that are learning to read or learning to speak the language. And so it can display pictures of commonly used words. So let's say you, uh, you know, you mouse over the word tree in text. If you hold your mouse over that, it can show a picture of, of a tree. So if somebody learns visually better, this can be a big help. Um, if you're advanced enough in the language where you're starting to learn sentence structure and grammar and things like that, it can highlight nouns, verbs, and, and the different elements that put together a sentence in that language. Um, so again, kind of helping people advance farther down that path. It can read the content out loud to you. So we're going to talk about you know, the speech service later. This is already an example where language and speech are working with each other to do some cool stuff. Um, it can display the syllables of words as well. So if you're trying to pronounce things better and things like that, it can be a big help there. Um, and it also uses the translator API, which kind of falls in that language category, but is, but is its own thing. Um, it uses that to translate the, these contents into other languages as well. So you can flip back and forth between maybe somebody's native language and, and the new one. Um, so again, I think this is a really cool place to start. The documentation has uh, an excellent tutorial and kind of walkthrough of all these features. So, and 
I'll say this over and over. If you're interested in this, check that out there um, and, and see what it has to offer and see if it might help you or help somebody that you know. Okay, so that's the AI for good stuff. The rest of the stuff I would say is probably, uh, it can be used for good. Um, it can also be used to kind of encourage people to buy things, which if you're a business owner is great. If you're the rest of us, maybe less great. So this is, so if you've ever gone to a website and you see usually the annoyingly perky person pop up in, in the lower right hand corner, kind of where my head is here. Um, and they, you know, pop up and, and there's a little conversation bubble that comes out and says, how may I help you? Um, it's likely you're talking to a chat bot and it's likely, it likely is powered by what we're going to talk about here on this slide or something similar. There are offerings from other providers, but I've spent time, a lot of time in, in the uh, Microsoft world. So, so that's where we're going to spend this time. So this is the language understanding intelligent service that does not roll off the tongue, but Luis might, it's at least shorter. Um, so what can it do? So it can determine the intent of a statement. So basically what it tries to do is it, is it breaks down, uh, it breaks down something you would type at a bot. So we're, we're kind of taking speech out of this. We're assuming you're not talking to it. You're doing some sort of a web chat and the thing pops up and says, how may I help you? And you say, I would like to order food. And that's where it's going to talk to the model here. And it's going to determine the intent of the statement which it's going to kind of parse through that and say, well, I think order is the intent of that statement. And it's going to try to isolate the entities described in, in the statement, like the second bullet says there. The entities there in that case are going to be food. Um, so what it will do from there, and, and if there's so much cool stuff in here, I, I, I could spend an hour on, on just this actually. And my friend Sam Nazar um, here in the States, he, he lives in Ohio, so one state north of me, uh, gives an excellent talk just on this. So if you're really interested in that, look him up online. He's at S-A-M-N-A-S-R. Um, does a fantastic talk, a really deep dive on this, which is really what it deserves. But I want you to at least know that it's there and, and roughly how it works. So it breaks down the intents and the entities in the text that it receives, and it returns a JSON object with basically um, kind of numeric confidence statements of what it thinks is in there. It's like, well, you know, I give this a confidence score of 0.9912 that the intent here is order. And I give it a confidence score of 0.91848 that the entity is food. And then what you have is a conversational model underneath this that's going to converse back and forth with you. So then it might lead you into, well, what kind of food would you like to order? How much of that food would you like to order? You know, when would you like to pick it up? Those sorts of things. Um, it does, as as the fifth bullet say there, says there, there are pre-built models. So there are things for like home automation, like smart home. Um, there are things for restaurant reservations, travel reservations, um, those sorts of things that Microsoft gives you pre-built models that you could set something up pretty quickly and, and customize yourself a bit, but the guts of what you need are there to kind of make it go. You can also create custom models as well. So for example, where I live, there, there's a lot of horse stuff. So we've race horses, eventing horses, hunter jumpers, all those sorts of things. And, and so I have a lot of friends that, that, that work at horse farms or, or do horse events and things like that. That, that sporting world has a lot of custom language and, and terminology that most of us that aren't in that world wouldn't be familiar with. So you could create a custom model here and let's say, let's say you have a tax shop where people can come buy supplies for their horse and, and the riding equipment they need and all that. Microsoft does not have a pre-built model for that, but you could create, test and train a custom model to still give your customer that conversational experience. Um, we can build an app using either APIs that are available or the Luis portal as well. So I've linked it here. And unfortunately, that's kind of where our journey with Luis ends. Again, I would refer you to my friend Sam's talk or go into the portal itself. There are some nice demos right on, on the front page and there are resources. Certainly mine is not 
the only book out that talks about this. There are tons of resources out there. Um, or just tweet at me and, and we'll see what we can go find. Um, very, very cool stuff here. But let's get to something. So Luis is neat. And it, it can be very easy to set up and show off. But it, as you might guess, can get complicated pretty quickly because it's giving you a rich conversational experience. So you might be sitting there saying, well, Matt, this is cool, but when are you going to get to the practical stuff, the things that, that I think you know are going to help me that maybe I can take back to my boss and say, well, I, I'm going to do this. It, that starts here. Um, so Q&A Maker is something that Microsoft offers that, uh, like I said, it serves information interactively. So is it a rich conversational experience? No. It's still neat the way it works, but you're going to see in an example I show you in a minute that the experience can be a little variable. It, it's it's very much a question and answer format. It's not a, it's not like like a choose your own adventure conversation kind of thing. You're trying to get information out of something, so it drives off what Microsoft calls knowledge bases, which kind of makes sense. And those are question and answer pairs. Pretty simple. Um, you can get those out of a web page. You can get them out of a tab separated value file. You can get them out of Word documents, Excel documents, PDF, all those sorts of things. Um, but it, it, at its root, it's pairs and pairs and pairs of Q&A, thus the name. So you may be thinking like, well, you just talked about Luis. It kind of sounds the same. It, it, so it is kind of like you could be talking to a chat bot that's, it, that's wired to a very complex Luis model or wired to a knowledge base that you know we would build here, you may not know the difference. Uh, but if you get kind of in an in-depth conversation with that thing, you're going to learn the difference pretty fast. Um, so here, and that's why I kind of sum the slide up with this, its flexibility comes from the depth of information that you provide and not the implementation under the covers. And so with that, we're going to get to a demo. We're going to talk about what Q&A Maker is, and we're going to go through some web chat. So given that we only have an hour, I've kind of pre-baked some of this stuff. Um, I, I have another session purely on, on bots that uh, I think is pretty cool. Um, and I, I show actually how, how you build one of these uh, in about 10 minutes. We don't have those 10 minutes here because we're trying to cover so much ground. So I've pre-built some of these. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to this one. And so this is an example I, I used to show in kind of one of my early talks. And, and, and one thing I'll, I'll caution you with here is that uh, sometimes, and as you're seeing here, uh, sometimes the UI for this can, can be a bit slow. Um, do not worry. And there's also another bug I've noticed that, that hopefully won't bite us as, as we walk through this live session. Um, but sometimes you'll actually have to sign out and back in to, to get this stuff to kick on uh, and, to, and to load your knowledge base properly. So uh, while we'll actually wait for that to do its thing, um, I'm going to flip over to this. And we'll go through what creating a knowledge base would look like. And then hopefully it will actually let us all look at mine. Uh, but I think by the end of this little example, you're going to understand kind of what, what this builds. And then we're going to go talk to one. So there are, as you see here, pretty simple, about five steps. So obviously, um, you would need an Azure Portal account. Um, there's a lot of free and, and very reduced price tiers and ways to get those. Um, most everything you've seen me build here can be built for either free or, or very minimal cost. So do not let cost scare you away. Um, I'm happy to chat in the live Q&A or afterwards online about kind of some cost management tips. Um, if you go with the not free pricing tiers or the not limited tiers, uh, those can get away from you just like anything else in Azure, but I'm certainly not advocating anything here that's going to cost much money at all. So what do we do here? We create a Q&A service in Azure, which makes sense. Um, this has kind of entertained me. So off and on over the years, you'll get a radio button here. It says, do you want to create the stable service or the preview service? So this stuff's always evolving. Like I said, when we worked on, on the book, we had to change so much stuff because they're always building new stuff. You'll see this come and go where um, you know you you may have no option and then that's that's the stable one or you may have the option we have here and so you would click there usually provisions in two to three minutes sometimes faster um, 
And then once the Q&A service is provisioned there, you give your subscription information to it. So your directory ID, the name of the subscription that you provisioned it in the name of the service and the language. And so let's take a brief look at language here. And really, I just want to draw your attention to, to a couple quick things. Um, so we've got where it says chit chat and extraction available. And that's a short, li well, I wouldn't say short, but shorter. So what does that mean? So extraction means it can extract the question and answer pairs out of the documents that you send it, right? Chit chat, when we get to the step four and five, you're going to see what that means. But what it is, is you can give these knowledge bases and really the bot that you're eventually going to lay over the top of this, a bit of personality. So if you'd like it, you know, where a lot of people will play with their phones and say, hey, Siri, tell me a joke or hey, Siri, what do you look like? And of course, there's my phone here uh, doing exactly what it's supposed to and responding to me saying that. So I will stop saying it. Um, but, you know, people will kind of play around with those uh, virtual assistants. This gives you some of that where it'll talk back and forth and tell jokes, but only in the languages you see here. So only in these nine. Now it can extract in, and this is quite a long list, right? And so if, if the personality of the bot is important to you, you are limited to these nine. If it's just purely, I ask it something, I want an answer back, then you've got a much longer list. Obviously, you're going to give your knowledge base a name. That makes sense. And then here is where we're going to specify, like, I want it to come from a web address. You know, I want it to come from a file, and I'm going to upload a file here. Um, Multi-turn extraction may be a little advanced for this, but I'll go ahead and chat about it briefly. It's it, when the question and answers are not isolated pairs, where it is kind of a conversation path, um, that, that'll enhance Q and A maker's ability to pick to pick that up. So again, kind of bridging that gap between where I said Q and A maker falls and where Luis type thing falls. Um, and then here we get down into the chit chat stuff. And uh, so, like I said, you can give it some personalities: professional, friendly, witting, carry, caring, enthusiastic. And then we get down to step five, and we're actually creating all of these. Um, but I'm not going to do that because, again, it does take a few minutes, um, start to finish, and then layering the bot over the top. Uh, I can do it in about 10 minutes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll try to go, we'll try to go back to my knowledge basis and click on that list here and see if it'll populate. Uh, in the meantime, well, let's see. We'll give it, we'll give it one more opportunity to play nice. But let's go. To, aha, here we go. So like I said, the UI on this, it's so cool, uh, but it can be slow. And it certainly likes to mess with presenters trying to record or offer a session like me. So what we've got here, um, and this is the first example of these that I ever built. I found a place in Florida that offered you the ability to pay some money and um, you could drive an exotic car for for a few days or for a few days for a few hours and you did it at their track they had instructors all those sorts of things their faq page was pretty good and so what i did is on that screen you just saw i just dropped that address in and created this and it extracted from that page questions and answers and what's interesting about, and you'll see this in one of the examples here in a second, is that if it's a web page, you'll, uh, you'll get all the HTML formatting too. So if there's, if, as you can see here, bullets or, or something like that, you'll get all of that as a response from, from the bot. So this is what it looks like. It's a pair of question and answers. And I also gave this one the ability to do friendly chit chat. So it's basically like, here's all the things people might say, and here's how it's going to answer. So silly, silly things. So let's talk to one. So this is a simple one that I made. Um, it is an Excel sheet that I made that's the simplest org chart ever. And I uploaded that in into a knowledge base. It's, it's the org chart example you saw briefly on that last screen. And so we're just going to talk to it. We're going to test this here in web chat. Say, who works for Jane Doe? And generally, and sometimes you do have to click the start over button up here, but today it's playing very nice. So I got this back and it was, it, and it, it was formatted in Excel, just 
just like this. Or actually, this was Word. Excuse me. Um, but I so I had bolded it so it pulls in the formatting exactly like that. So I said, "Who works for Jane Doe?" I got that. I I made a Word document in 30 seconds, created this in about 10, and now I have a bot where people can ask org chart stuff. So you could imagine using that for like servers and it and environments or when somebody says like well what you know what app lives on what box or what data center is is sql you know 17a in you could build an excel sheet you could build a word document for all that and then tell people you know what i built a bot for that go talk to that um i i have work that i have to do so we'll um so we'll do one more thing here so zappos is a shoe retailer uh at least in the states and maybe a few other places so just to show you kind of how this may be so you know i've asked a question and if i'm talking to a luis model it's going to kind of probably get us to the place where it's i'm asking about their return policy but i didn't say that i said how can i return my shoes thing comes back and it's not really talking about that um but if i ask what is your return policy I'm going to get an answer back that's exactly what I'm asking for. So this is the simplicity and limitations of Q&A Maker. But again, what we're looking at here, we're talking to a bot. Um, I built in probably 10 to 12 minutes. So we test it here. Um, what you can do over here is if you click through to channels, because you're going to see there's this tab over here that's sitting on my blog that says, hello, chatbot. I can go to get bot embed codes. And so I want web chat and all right, the UI is being a little bit difficult with me tonight. Okay, here we go. So this gives you your keys. And again, I can go into a deeper dive on this. I've got blogs on this um, that come out of the chatbot session where we just spend an hour talking about this. Um, but with about 25 minutes to go, we're gonna skim over this here. Um, and th this is an iframe. So my gifts don't lie in web design at all, but I know how to put an iframe on a site. So your key would go where it says your secret here, cut and paste this. I dropped it into a page on my blog. And so we already asked who works for Jane Doe. Let's ask who works for John Doe. And it's going to come back and give me that answer. So this is out on my site, public. We can play with it. Um, very, very cool stuff here. So those, that is Q&A Maker and kind of the chatbot world and, and a lot of chat about what that means so let's get back to our slides and let's get uh, back in some more information and into some more demos as well so all right you heard me refer to sentiment analysis earlier um, so that's part of the text analytics under the language api and there's a number of things that it can do it can do language detection which obviously goes hand in hand with with the translator as well. It can do key phrase extraction. So if you go to Yelp or, or any review site, and it'll say, you know, reviews of this uh, place say, you know, great pasta, great food, great drinks, you know, horrible service, whatever. They're using key phrase extraction to get that out of the text of people writing all, all of those things. Um, named entity recognition is a little bit weird. It, I'll explain it to you this way. In layman's terms, if you're on a site and you mouse over something and it wants to direct a link to somewhere else, odds are some sort of name entity recognition app has run against that and kind of put those links out there. Um, and it also has some disambiguation stuff in it too, which that's a big fancy way of saying it knows the difference between Venus the planet and Venus the god. So it looks for like, context clues and things like that and actually uses wikipedia as kind of a giant knowledge base to do that disambiguation kind of work um, so we talked about what key phrase extraction can mean let's chat about sentiment analysis here for a second what it does is it scores the sentiment of a bit of text so the example that i talked about it kind of started me on the path to ai stuff where i am now uh, i talked about we were scoring tweets um, you can score, and in fact, um, this has come a long way from when I started working on it. You can score tweets, you can score posts, you can score pages and pages of documents. 
It will even give you sections. This is a positive section. This is a negative section, all those sorts of things. At its core, the simplest thing it does is it analyzes text and it will give you a number and it will be somewhere between zero and one, a very long decimal usually. Uh, 0.5 means it can't figure it out. Uh, the closer to one it is, the more positive the sentiment is. The closer to zero it is, the more negative the sentiment is. So I talked about some low code and no code ways to do that. So here's one. So if you're not familiar with Azure Logic Apps, these are really cool. They're basically event-driven workflow containers. So not containers in like the Kubernetes sense. It's just this is a stateless kind of serverless thing that spins up. And when an event happens, it it knows, oh, I'm supposed to do this with it. So for example here, and I created a Cognitive Services resource to do this, and there's a link on my resource slide that goes into um, heavy detail on exactly how to build this, because we don't have time to go through it now, but I want to at least show it to you. So we're in the Logic App Designer here. The event that drives this workflow is when a new tweet is posted. So what does that look like? So this is actually something I built. Um, we have a Corgi dog, and so my wife got a kick out of this. It was analyzing the sentiment of people tweeting about these dogs. Were they happy about them or not? They were thrilled with them because they're very cute. So you say a search text, and it will use the Twitter search API to look at this on an interval you specify, um, as long as traffic isn't too heavy. And that's one of those cost control things that, that we can talk about in the live Q&A afterwards. Um, so it searches this, and every minute, if it if the search API pulls some things back, then it feeds it into this next step. So this is a detect sentiment action against a Cognitive Services resource or a text analytics resource within Azure. And so it, it'd be as simple as me going up here and typing text analytics, clicking through it, clicking create, specifying the stuff it asks for, and off we go. So what is the detect sentiment action ingesting? It's ingesting the text of the tweet or tweets that come from here. It spins up one of these instances for each tweet. So the output of this, though it doesn't really show it here, is that numeric score. And so what this does, and obviously I don't have time to show you all the reports and all that, trust me, the dogs are very cute, people love them, is it feeds to two different Power BI data sets. And then you can do data visualizations and things off of that. So this is an example. There's not a line of code here. Logic apps are all JSONs. So there's no smoke and mirrors. I didn't write any code. This was drag and drop. I'm just clicking plus. Um, and I built something that you know can take tweets and can score those tweets. And then you can send that off to Power BI or whatever to visualize that you can also store it in an Azure SQL database and actually the example that links on my resource slide that's exactly what I did is I stored it in an Azure SQL database to show it some different ways so if you're interested in that um, check out the deep dive link on on my resources slide okay so we've done our sentiment analysis demo we had a crash course in what Azure Lo Azure logic apps are um, I think most of us probably know what Twitter is. So let's talk about translation next. This is really cool stuff. Um, so this is not speech translation, but stay tuned. We're going to talk about that. But the guts of it are similar. So what can translator text do? Let's go through these four bullets, and then I will, uh, I'll drill down in, into a couple of them. So unsurprisingly, the first thing I decide to put here is it can translate text. Now you see, I said they're using neural machine translation, otherwise known as NMT. So it makes sense that the translator API, the translator text API can translate stuff, right? So what is NMT and why did I call that out? So the NMT models are not exposed to the end user. So a lot of this stuff's pretty open. The NMT models are not. It's pretty highly specialized stuff and I would imagine a bit proprietary as well. And there's an element of this in, on the speech side too. Um, NMT, I would say, from my reading, and, and this, you know, this is not my area of preeminent expertise, uh, but from my reading, it is, it's, I would say, the more modern way to do it, the more precise way, the faster way to do it. There's another thing known as statistical machine translation, 
SMT that is a bit, let's say, old school, even though we're obviously using very advanced computing to do it. Um, if you go to the Cognitive Services documentation and you look up what languages I can translate to and from, and that's an ever-evolving list, it will call out which type of translation is happening, which speaks to a limited extent to the precision of that translation and some of those sorts of things. So long story short, it can translate stuff really fast. Um, but how fast it goes just kind of depends on which model it's using. Generally, as an end user, it doesn't affect our experience at all. It affects the number crunching behind the scenes to continually train these models. Um, what else can it do? It can transliterate text. So I think this is really cool. And actually, there was a fascinating demo when I was at DPS in person two years ago of a Microsoft person showing off kind of an early version of this. Um, my presentation setup and rig is unfortunately not capable of doing anything as, as cool as that. Um, but I want you to know that that's available. You know, I'm thinking we probably have people here from all over the world who speak languages that don't share a common alphabet. So if we need to switch from one to another, to another that's based on, on a different alphabet, Translator API can also do that. Um, it can detect language. So we talked about that earlier. Um, there's a couple different ways in here to do that. Obviously, language detection is going to be a key part of translation because uh, it needs to know how to handle like what it's looking at. And the example we're going to look at in the next demo goes through exactly that. Uh, and it can look up word translations as, as well. So I talked about a demo. Let's have a look at the demo. So this is a translator console app. And to do that, because I'm on a Mac, as you might have noticed, we are going to have to play with a VM a bit. So here we go. So what I've got is I have a C Sharp app back here. So let's take a second and look at this. As I mentioned, I'm not a C Sharp developer at all. Um, but what I have here is about a 100, 101, 102 line app that began life as one of the Microsoft quick starts. And it talks about um, or it kind of walks you through how this translation works. So how does it work? Basically, I've given it my subscription key and endpoint up there. I would recommend securing those in environment variables for anything production. You don't want your subscription key to be in live code. But for our purposes here, and I'll disable that resource very soon, uh, we can go ahead and walk through that here. So it uses that endpoint. It adds this route onto it. And so it's saying call me call version three of the API because they will support as as the versions increase they support you know multiples and then it says two and I've got language codes here so French German Italian and I'll save the fourth one as a little bit of a surprise for the end if you're a fan of Star Trek you'll get a kick out of this I write to the console and say please type the phrase you'd like to translate it feeds in it then makes a JSON array out of it. And so then it comes in down here. It puts together basically an HTTP call, builds that, sends it up with the subscription key location, all that. It sends the result async and says, I'm just kind of waiting on this to come back. And then it deserializes the result and outputs it with a confidence score as well. So let's actually see this run. So Again, console app, nothing fancy. We'll go ahead and run this. Um, and we'll say, I hope you are liking this session so far. Okay, so what comes out? So it's basically 100% confident that it was English that I typed, which is good because it was. This is the array, the raw that comes back. So it outputs it nicely here, but you can see we've got We've got an array of translations, French, German, Italian, so on. Those just kind of come out this way. They're semi-nicely formatted down here. Um, and I know the German's right. I speak a little bit of German. I can't speak to the French or the Italian. And I said, if you're a Star Trek fan, you'll get a kick out of the fourth one. Uh, Cognitive Services can actually translate to and from Klingon as well. And that's what that one is. So... These aren't hard to build, even if we have to dive in and build code. Like I said, I, I built this off a of quick start. I'm, I'm certainly far from the world's best C-sharp dev, far from even an average one. But I was able to build this and get this running in, in probably an hour of work. So very, very cool stuff here.
So let's go back to the slides. Let's go away from remote desktop. We don't need you anymore. And we're going to talk about speech. Uh, so we've got, you know, just, just a few minutes left here. So like I said, language is, is the core. And I, I talked about a lot of the examples, especially with Q&A maker stuff of, of how I think it applies to data pros. You know, we could put a list of environments. We could put an org chart in there. Really, any, any repetitive questions we get, we can make. Q&A maker do that work for us and tell somebody, say, hey, talk to my bot and ask it that this stuff so I can focus on my work. So speech is a kind of a layer abstracted from that. But as data people, I want us all exposed to it because, like I said, this my knowledge of this and working with it has caused my career to take some pretty interesting paths. Uh, and and I, I hope the same for for everybody. Um, so what is the speech API, otherwise known as speech services or speech service, depending on which document you're reading? So what does it do? So I'm going to go through the features first, and then I'm going to talk about something called Speech Studio, which is, is a no-code way to build some of these things. So what can it do? Unsurprisingly, it can do speech to text. So you can see you're probably sitting there thinking like, well, yeah, that a that makes sense and b this is how the how it can work together with language api stuff yes so it can do speech to text it can transcribe audio in 90 plus languages i think as of my recording of this session it's 92. Um, there, it also handles some variants and dialects as well um, again check the documentation for updates on that because those it's updated frequently uh, it can do the reverse as well. So it can go text to speech in 60 plus languages, variants, dialects, so on and so forth. Um, generally 200 plus voices. I think when I checked prior to this recording, we're at 215. Um, so it does attempt to do some native speaking voices, um, even in different regions of certain countries and all of that. Obviously, a, a continuing work in progress, uh, but it's just very, very cool stuff. Um, and, and if you're trying to reach a customer where they're at or, or make an application experience richer, um, or let's say what I just talked about, you're building, you've built a bot, so, and you work for a company that's got data centers all over the world, and people from all over the world are going to talk to your bot and ask, which server is this app on, and what do I need to connect to to run this run book. Um, you can have it speak back and forth to them in, um, in a voice that may sound similar to something that they're going to hear at home, no matter where they are. Uh, so what else can it do? So it can do translation speech to speech. Now that's only 30 plus languages so far, and I couldn't find a hard count. It just, everything kind of says 30 plus. Um, but it can, it can do that real time. Um, I had a plan to show that to you in person. Unfortunately, because of the way the recording works, because of the audio subsystem on my machine and those sorts of things, I cannot play the audio for you. So I'm going to walk you through something similar where it's basically translating it to text in real time. And we're just all going to imagine that it worked perfectly because it does when I'm not recording it. Um, last but not least, it can handle speaker recognition as well. So this has a couple of different use cases. So, you know, obviously probably a lot of us are in virtual meetings all the time now. And it can be helpful, especially again, going back to like a multinational corporation, which probably a lot of us do work for or have. It can be helpful to know who's speaking in a meeting and those sorts of things. You may want to do that live. You may want to do that after the fact for transcripts and things like that. So speaker recognition helps you do that. It can also be used, um, and I think this is kind of an interesting example, you can use it for security as well. So you could have kind of an additional layer of authentication to get into your facility or something like that and, and use the sound of somebody's voice to you know combine with a fingerprint or something like that to let them in um, again probably not as, as data people probably not something any of us are going to see a lot of uh, but kind of a cool thing to think about and like i said the whole point of this session is just for you to kind of carry the spark of an idea out and 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 apply it to something cool um, so it can do all that 
So I mentioned if we, there we go. It, the slides don't always want to advance right when I tell them to. So I mentioned something called Speech Studio. So I just talked about the features and I'm going to show you here at the very end what a console app calling speech service stuff looks like. And it's going to look similar to, to the language API one that I just showed you. Speech Studio, and this is really not a good analogy, but for the purposes of this session, we're going to say it is. So I showed you where Logic Apps is, uh, is where you can engage cognitive services resources without writing any code. But you can do a lot within Logic Apps. You could do a whole session just on all the stuff that it can do. But that's how we showed it. Speech Studio is that is that equivalent. They're very different beasts. Um, so Speech Studio is isolated just on speech. That's what it does. But it allows you to build resources for that that you can then call with apps and those sorts of things. So the link to it is speech.microsoft.com. Um, there's a lot of free ways to explore it there. So again, if you're worried about cost or you're on a very strict Azure budget you can play around with a lot of this stuff for free um, check it out there there are some walkthroughs quick starts like, like like all the things we've talked about let's be honest microsoft wants us to use this and use it a lot because they make money uh, but they do give us that free tier to learn it which is really cool um, so what do they call it so microsoft and this is the last marketing speak we're going to have because we only have about five minutes left. Uh, UI-based tools for building and integrating features from Azure Speech Service in your applications. Broad and vague, right? So what does that really mean to us? So what, what when you go in a speech studio, what can you do? So I, th so I wanted to go over everything it can do. There's basically eight kind of core elements, experiences, whatever you want to call them, that you can do in there. Um, I group them into this slide, which I think is probably most relevant to the people that, that are here. Um, and then the next slide, just I want you to know about it, um, but it's probably less relevant to our immediate interests. So it can do drag and drop speech to text. So if you have an audio file, let's say you recorded the audio of this session, or you recorded the audio of other sessions, or you recorded audio of, of your child speaking, or, or your partner, or something like that. You could drop that into the speech studio. It's a web-based UI and it's going to transcribe that for you from a number of languages like we just talked about. It's not limited to just English or just a handful. There's there's lots. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's an interesting thing to play with and you could then use some language API stuff to do sentiment scoring and things like that. Um, it's got a voice gallery as well. So you can kind of browse the voices that you could use to make audio content. Um, it can do a pronunciation assessment. So if you've used anything like Duolingo or Babbel or those sorts of things, and, and it's assessing your pronunciation to know how good you're doing, how well you're doing at speaking the, the language, it's powered by something like this. It can do custom voice. So you can actually make your own custom models from voice recordings of somebody. Now, obviously that could have some creepy uses. And if you've if read anything about AI deep fakes and things like that, some of that is where this comes from. You can take recordings of somebody's voice and make them say things they never said. That's not cool. But technically, te technology wise, it is kind of cool. Um, and then here's some other things it can do. So you can do audio content creation within Speech Studio. So putting together content for like audiobooks, chat bots, that, that speech layer that we didn't really talk about. But you could you know layer that over the top and you could handle that content here. Um, you can make custom speech models. Uh, these are not publicly accessible. So if that you know gives your company a competitive leg up and they're in a field where this matters, um, they can do custom speech there, again, without writing any code. Custom keywords. So if you said like, hey, hey Alexa, I'm not going to say the thing again because I don't want to wake my phone up. Um, it, it's part of how voice activated products work. And you can do custom commands as well. So if you have an app where it, the voice walks through all of it. It's a code-free way to build it. Microsoft then hosts that content, and then you can use APIs to call it. So what would one of these console apps look like? like when we talk to the speech API, what does it look like? Let's go over that very briefly. And for that, we're going to use Visual Studio uh, 2019 on, on my Mac. So the link to this is on the resources slide. And like I said, this works beautifully if I'm not recording a session.
but I, in recording a session, so Visual Studio can't access the audio, and despite quite quite a bit of effort, um, there is no way to make them play nice with each other. So what would happen with this is if I ran it up here and I wasn't recording this, um, it would say it would basically say say something. I would say something. And then it would output the text in a language that I chose. So let's walk through how that works. So this, so in this quick start that they put together, it's not detecting the language. You're saying it's going to be a U.S. English speaking person that talks to you. And then you're going to add a target language. Now you can add more than one. The quick start deals with German, but similar to the console app I showed you last time, you could translate what you're saying into a number of languages. I'm not aware of an upper limit. I'm sure that there is one. Um, and now you're also specifying the voice here. So we talked about voice gallery and custom voices and things like that. That's where you specify what I want this person to sound like. So we've specified all that. And then basically it hears the audio. It hears me stop talking, cuts the stream, and it calls out to the speech service that I've got with my key and region right here. And it's got a method for that. And this uses the speech SDK that will download when you grab this code. And again, that links on, on the next slide. It will recognize it. It will translate it using calls back and forth to speech service. And it will then, uh, you know, kind of package that up and it will stop and it will tell you to press enter to stop. You'll press enter and it spits out and it says everything that you just said to it in whatever number and kind of languages you specified it. But hopefully what you're seeing walking through this is in many ways, dealing with the speech API is a little friendlier almost than the language API. There's custom methods in here for doing this stuff. And that's where the SDK comes in. The language doesn't really have its own SDK. Speech does. Uh, but it, this isn't scary code. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not a good C-sharp dev. And this, I can handle this. Um, all right. So let's wrap this up. So here are resources. So there's the Amazon link for the book. I don't mean the shill for that. But there is, if you want to deep dive on this stuff, we're, we're proud of what we did. And I want you to know about it. Um, I also linked to the Cognitive Services Overview. I talked about how to get sentiment analysis data from the Logic App into Azure SQL DB. That link is here. I also linked to a number of the speech service quick starts, um, including the one we just showed. And that final link is actually the GitHub repo for that. Here are all the ways to find me. Again, I'm SQL at Speed everywhere online. Please reach out. Uh, I want feedback on this session. It's brand new for this event. So if you think it was great, tweet it. If you think it was terrible, email me and don't tell anybody else. Um, in all seriousness, though, any feedback I get is going to make it better the next time. And I, I love talking about this stuff. I hope that comes through. Um, thank you very much to Microsoft for supporting DPS and so many other things. Um, and thank you all for being here, coming to see me and everybody else, all 200 folks. Um, do all the stuff it says here so we can win free stuff just like we were all in person. And I sincerely hope that we're able to continue this conversation in person sometime soon. Thank you so much and bye for now. Mm -hmm.